So now, after all that, knowing how to beat and how to show the character of the music in the beat, finding the right tempo and managing a tasteful rubato, after all this, we are still at the beginning of the conductor's job. Now he is faced with the prospect of a sea of knowledge that must be his, and so deeply his that it is automatic. This knowledge begins with the ability to read the score. Now, an orchestral score is a highly complicated thing. You see, a singer has to learn only one line of music, one note at a time, and maybe have some vague knowledge of the accompaniment. The same is true for a violinist. A pianist, of course, has many more notes to learn at a time. But a conductor has to learn and know thoroughly an astonishing number of notes, voices, and parts all at once. Uh, take this opening bar of Brahms' First Symphony, for instance. There are 55 printed notes in this one bar being played by 80 to 100 instruments. And the conductor has to know them all, or else he has no right to ascend the podium in the first place. And this is only one bar out of 1,260 bars in this symphony. Now, uh, what does the conductor do when he is faced with a score like this for the first time? Usually, he begins by reading it through more or less superficially, something like racing through a detective story. There is the same element of suspense and the desire to discover how it will all turn out. But what he sees, he also hears in his head. And people are always amazed to discover that a conductor hears the score as he looks at it. But it is true. And the extent to which he can is, in a way, a measure of his talent. Now, in this first reading, he must also form his opinion of the cultural and stylistic position of this work. He must know about Brahms' background historically. In other words, a conductor is not only a musician. He must also be a kind of artistic historian. Well, now, he has examined the score swiftly from cover to cover. And now, the real work begins. You must take it apart in all its aspects and study each one of them. Now he looks at page one. What does he see? First of all, he sees that the whole orchestra is playing, with the exception of three trombones, which will enter only in the fourth movement for the big finale. Then he sees that the woodwinds, or the two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, and two bassoons, are all playing the same thing, a descending line which makes a kind of choir sound. Now the conductor immediately looks for any other instrument <laughs> in any other choir, for example, the brass or the strings, that may be playing the same material, the same descending line. Musicians call this doubling. Now, who is doubling these wind parts? Now, here he finds it. Here, two horns are playing a part of that descending line. <coughs> and here the violas are playing all of it. But he still has not found the melody, which is the real heart of the matter. This is the other thing our old friend Wagner declared to be especially important for a conductor. The ability to find the melody in all this mass of notes. Well, here is the melody. He finds it in the violins, which, after all, it belongs in, and it is this ascending line. It is played, as you see, by the first violins, by the second violins, an octave lower, and by the celli, an octave lower than that. So, we have now found two elements moving at once, one climbing and the other descending. You see that the pull of these two lines against each other, going in opposite directions, is setting up the atmosphere of tension and conflict which will characterize this whole first movement. But the two lines are not all he sees. Here, he finds a long-held note in the other two horns, 
which are growling out the bass. Now this note is reinforced by the double basses, which repeat the note over and over again, six times per bar. Then our conductor sees that the kettle drum, or timpani, is doing the same thing as the double basses, strengthening them with its penetrating percussion. And finally, the trumpets are doubling that bass note up high to help give a brilliant start to the piece. So now our conductor has found three elements going simultaneously. The two lines tearing away at each other over a fateful, ominous series of thuds in the bass. All this gives him the clues to the musical meanings of all these dots and marks and patterns. It must be dramatic, tense, straining, suffering, doom-ridden. Well, now he must decide how fast all this is going to go. The tempo indication by Brahms is, as you see, un poco sostenuto. This means a little sustained and clearly tells us nothing. How can you measure a rate of speed by three Italian words? All we can know is that it must be sustained and therefore not fast. But why then didn't Brahms simply write slow? You see, what Brahms is getting at is a kind of steady tread, which must be solemn and ominous, all right, but yet not so slow that it will hinder the flow of those two tense lines sounding above it because some of that tension must be achieved through the straining forward motion. Otherwise, the, lo the lines won't pull against each other strongly enough. Well, all this considered, it now devolves upon the conductor to decide upon the true tempo. His tempo may come out like this if he takes a cue from those repeated drum beats and emphasizes the aspect of doom and solemnity. conductor might decide on a completely different tempo in order to emphasize the other element, the straining forward of the two melodic lines. Both versions, I suppose, could be called un poco sostenuto. The difference lies in the conductor's conception of the work. Well, now, perhaps our man at last is ready to conduct page one of Brahms first. No, wait. He must still consider the letter F at the beginning of each part. F stands for forte and means loud in Italian. Now, uh, even here he is faced with a decision. How loud? If Brahms had wanted it very loud indeed, he could easily have written two Fs or even three. But no, there's just one F, just plain loud. There is something of Brahms' classical restraint involved here. It's sort of like un poco sostenuto. Poco sostenuto, not too sustained. Don't go overboard on the slow tempo and don't go overboard on the volume either. So one forte, loud but not too loud. And then the dynamics, those little words, legato, meaning connected. Espressivo, which as you can imagine means expressively. Pesante which means heavy on those bass notes. Now, is he ready to conduct this page? I'm afraid not. For example, let's take those horn notes we were talking about before, which play the descending line. These notes happen to lie in the highest brilliant register of the horn and have a way of coming peeling out like church bells, which is all well and good if they don't drown out the rest of the orchestra. And here comes the whole problem of balancing an orchestra. The conductor must realize that in order to have real balance, his horns are going to have to start playing in a reduced version of that forte, that F, or else they're going to come clanging in and upset the two connected, smooth, tense lines which are going on. Now let me show you how it would sound if the horns go uncontrolled. As you 
you see, you can hear horns and very little else. And now we will do it controlling the horns. And this is only one of many such subtleties that are the conductor's responsibility, since Brahms himself didn't say anything in the score about varying the volume of the horns. Thank you. 